Today's COVID update is brought to you by Fultech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. And we are back. We get into our second conversation this morning, and it is with a panel, as we had mentioned, from the Belize History Association. And the discussion this time around is on Belizeanizing history. We have with us via Zoom, Dr. Abigail McKay. She is the chair of the Belize History Association. Good morning, Dr. McKay. Good morning. Good morning, Belize. We also have an educator from St. John's College, none other than Delmar Zib. Good morning, Delmar. Good morning. And then we have a senior member of the Belize History Association, Ifashina Ifunyemi. Good morning. Good morning. Beat Benafe. Beat Benafe. And last but certainly not least is Rolando Kokom. He is the Research and Education Officer uh, with the Institute of Social, Cultural, and Research at the Niche. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> All right. So, Belizeanizing history. It seems to be a rather broad conversation we're about to embark in this morning. Uh, where do you want us to begin from? I'll, I'll throw this to Dr. McKay first. Thank you. Uh, what I want to say is that this is our seventh uh, annual lecture. We partner with the September Celebration Committee to put in uh, important components of Belizeans. We all have to learn our history. And every year we, we attempt to do so through a particular theme. And this year we decided on uh, the topic of decolonization. The pandemic has put us in a space globally where we're all looking at how we live our lives, how it intersects, um, what actually is going on and how do what we've known for decades and centuries, do those things still, um, they still, are of merit today and it led to a consideration of what's colonization like and are we at a place where are we still colonized what is the geopolitics etc and we got to a place at looking at belize and our independence what it meant we got political independence uh, did we get economic independence are we still colonized these are all questions that we ask, and I'm sure Belizeans and residents and our diaspora all think the same thing. And so our approach was to look at some of our scholars, uh, to ask them to share some of their research that has been done in the mm -hmm. population with Dr. Penados. We're looking at uh, education. Mr. Siv is... Um, focused, some of his research was focused on uh, education. We're looking at the independence um, connections, the internalize, internationalizing our independence and that story. If Ashina is going to set the groundwork by looking at the relevance and the definition of uh, decolonization. Okay, so that's the perfect. That's, that's, that's the picture that's what we want to bring to. Believe, That's the perfect more. segue for Ifashina to join in on the conversation at this point. Well, you see, here we are preparing to celebrate our, our what, 39th independence. I mean, if we think about arriving at, for those of us that are a, a bit up in age, uh, arriving at 39, um, at drawing to the end of another decade of life, we have to be considering as a nation, are we satisfied with where we are at this age and stage in our development as a nation? And that is why it is important to look at decolonization because when we gained our independence, it was that we were no longer colonized. That was the whole aim of gaining independence. That was the whole aim of the nationalist movement was so that we were no longer under the control of another uh, imperial nation that was basic that had basically invaded our space and taken over even though we already had established an established civilization here and and then they brought peoples here and then they brought their own ideologies and everything about them to us how much of that did we actually let go of so when we look at decolonization we have to be considering analytically 
have we truly let go of the colonizer and all the influences that the colonizer brought to us that we have now brought into our independence? Kind of like when you're leaving your home space to, to go into that life of adulthood, how much of what you learned and what you, you got from your parents do you then take into your, into your independence? And if it is that you keep going back home all the time whenever there is a problem, if it is that you still depend heavily on your home space um, for your economic survival, if you're depending on your home space for guidance on how to make decisions, um, you have to then question, am I truly independent? And that is also the way we have to be looking at our decolonization as a nation. Are we truly independent? How much of what the British left are we still holding on to? Some things they have let go of and we are still holding on to those things. Have, we haven't thoroughly revised our laws as yet. There are so many questions about when we listen to the national anthem itself and what it says um, and who do we honor in that. When we talk about our history and we teach about our history, what are we highlighting, the ho holidays that we celebrate? Um, there's, still, there's still all those questions about, is this truly representative? of me is this truly representative of all of us that have contributed to what this nation is today so it is that question that i am i'm bringing um in my presentation about what decolonization really and truly means for our nation so the four of you guys it's safe to say are all history buffs right has this been debated this very same question that you raised if has this been debated amongst the four of you guys? Let's go to Delmar and see how he feels about the position that you've taken and put forward. Well, I think, um, first of all, I, I approach this particular question in uh, at two different levels. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that um, history in itself, and I want to start with history, precisely because history is what is at stake to me in this whole discussion of decolonizing Belize. Um, what is important about history is that I always say history is not the past and the past is not history. What do I mean by that? When we talk about history, we talk about an analysis of the past, which means that we take a portion of that past, we analyze it and we find meaning and to an extent we give it meaning. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the history of Belize, a lot of our history itself has been written by the colonizers. Mm -hmm. So it is a deep process of outrooting not only um, the ideas of the colonizer, but also the history of the colonizer and how it portrayed us as Belizeans. Mm -hmm. And then at the second level, when you look at um, colonization, colonization happened at two different um, um, levels as well. It happened at the physical level where they came in, dominated us, controlled us to an extent, um, politically represented us, politically, you know, determined our society. Yet there is another level as well, which looks at the mind where we were conditioned for, for hundreds of years to live in a particular way culturally, to think in a particular way, to behave in a particular way. And I think it is an important arena to start decolonizing. Why? Because from what I understand, the hottest debate about decolonization is still the Battle of St. George's Key. That's the reality. Yeah. Nobody else really um, talks about let's decolonize the whole education system or let's decolonize our history as a big project. Mm -hmm. I think until today, at least from my understanding, the Battle of St. Jardis still continues to be um, an arena where people are still battling wh whether or not we're celebrating the British or whether or not we should be celebrating Belize. And I think it is an important step forward because we need to start questioning. And I think that's where we are at. We're at a, an important stage with this particular um, um, lecture of hinting the ideas of let's question and it's okay to question you shouldn't be afraid to question because it's part of thinking and it's part of developing and it's part of moving this country forward but Delmer, as an educator you will admit that you're part of the very system that keeps on promoting the same the same colonization in that the educational system what they actually teach us and how much they teach us about Belize and our nation is very limited. I know at least St. John's has made an attempt mm -hmm. to include Mayan history and African history. So you're part of the system. And how, yes. so how do you <laughs> see us breaking down that system? Well, I think the, the reality is that um, there is no direct answer. And, and 
And I can't answer you by stating, oh, we're going to go back to the pre-colonial times, because then that, that would be unreal. We're already in 2020, and we need to find a common ground where we need to look at the realities of colonization and its impact, and also look at how we can give some sort of empowerment. To me, decolonization is all about empowerment. Now, I understand your question, and, and I agree. I am part of the system. However, um, I follow a, a different philosophy, by the, the philosophy of a man by the name of Paulo Freire, who talks about pedagogy of freedom and pedagogy yes. of hope, mm -hmm. which is all about giving the student an experience where that student feels empowered within the classroom. So it's not only about what we teach, you know, it's not only about history, it's not only about um, having students look at particular concepts, it's about a philosophy of the mind, which looks at questioning, which looks at allowing the student to free themselves mentally and allowing them to feel free to say, hey, I disagree with that. This is my perspective. This is how I look at it. Or even um, look at when a student reacts to a particular idea that is indigenous, for example, I, I've gotten this um, response on many occasions, that is crazy. Fine, you have that idea, but that idea of that is crazy is the start to questioning. Mm -hmm. Because but then we look, if you begin to explore deeper into why that is crazy is a statement, that is crazy is a result of colonialism, you know. Well, you remember in that same philosophy of um, Paulo Freire in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, remember yeah. he makes the uh, analogy of man being in a cave. Mm -hmm. And when he mm -hmm. came out and saw the light, some of them could not deal with the light. Yes. And, it, and it's the truth. And so they go back. So I could understand why some kids will say, um, you know, that yeah. is crazy. But my question now is, what is the response of our young people? Is it a subject they really like? I mean, because that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. Are they interested? Mm -hmm. Do they show enthusiasm to try and I discuss this issue which is at the core of their existence and the what? educational system and the beliefs that they're expected to perform in? I, I, I think they are actually. They, they are very interested. They are very intrigued by it. Again, to me, it all goes back to how it is approached. Because I could literally spend years just giving you dates and giving you, um, this was the, the, the Bertha Judge Price, whatever. But that won't make a difference if I don't allow them to find a meaning to it. And I think that's the whole um, idea within education, where once the student manages to get a connection to it, a real-time connection and a real-time meaning to it, then it becomes a, 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 something that is living within the classroom and something that is living within society as well. Yes. I have to, can I chime in there? We, we want to hear from Rolando. R Rolando, what would you want to add to this discussion? Because I see that you're a researcher and education officer in true niche, partially government. What, what is your input? What do you see? Uh, I thank you, everyone. And I enjoy the remarks by my uh, co-panelists this morning. I, I believe that the, the mission is there. The mission is how can we make Belize a better society? And one method of doing that is looking at decolonization and looking at the legacies um, of colonialism as an ideology and all their practices in different areas. Um, Belize, as an independent country, obviously is undergoing decolonization. Now, some may want that process to be much more quicker. Um, some would want that process to be much more strategic. And this is why we have these type of events. Um, through ISCR and which we organize different panels, we help support um, different lectures um, as some of you may know, we are also tasked with regulating uh, some, well, the research permits of applicants in the country. And we, while we do that, we also know that research needs to be exposed. We need to get them circulated in the country. And, and this is just one of those other means by which we can, as Delmer rightly said, empower others with information. Knowledge is power, and it has always been um, carefully guarded by those who, with, with most to lose and with most to gain. And the process of decolonization is essentially how can we empower others with knowledge and encourage them to continue the change that they desire. And through ISCR, this means many things. It means, for instance, um, promoting cultural workers, safeguarding traditional knowledge, particularly if you think about things like language, um, traditional medicine. These are all important systems 
important knowledge that are at risk today and that needs safeguarding. Therefore, we must all try to identify those things that have been impacted by this long and disastrous process of colonialism, not just in Belize, it's certainly across the world. And as Dr. McKay mentioned with the pandemic, the, the economic disparity um, implemented through colonialism and imperialism is still reflected in our society today. And there's a, there's a long road ahead and there's a struggle ahead. Do you believe- People must be engaged. Do you believe then that perhaps it can be construed by others that decolonization would mean a purging or a whitewashing of some of the history, in this case of Belize, that may not have been uh, the most pleasant of experiences to discuss. We're looking at, for instance, slavery. Yep. We're looking at all these mm -hmm. other institutions that have shaped our national philosophy over the past centuries and, and decades and so forth. Would you believe then that, would you not accept them? Uh -huh, go ahead. It's not purging. It's our attempt is to analyze, to expose, to highlight, mm -hmm. to make, to put it on the table, dissect it, and talk about what it has meant to us. As uh, Delmar speaks of uh, looking at life and history on two levels, mm -hmm. and it really is true. Actually, if you look at culture, that's the biggest part of how we manifest who we are. Colonization, who we are, exactly. And we have to stop and think about every aspect of our life. So it's not about purging. You may choose to keep some. If I should have spoke to some of the negative things that we continue to hold on to, even while the imperial colonizer, in our case, Britain, mm -hmm. has let go off in the law. Legislation yeah. is one of the best examples. We are holding on to some laws that they have I agree. Up on for decades. So for us, it is Firmly not purging. It is to put it on the table and determine mm -hmm. how these things fit into shaping who we are and do we want to continue using those. Dr. McKay, I also, Dr. I also McKay, wanted to you... mention as it related to the being in the classroom and, and trying to bring that concept I mean, when you talk to students about deliberate psychological conditioning, they're like, really, what's, what's that all about? Yeah. And then, you know, I ask them a simple question. I say, you know, all right, so you heard uh, in, your, in primary school about people crossing the Bering Strait in 10,000 BC, right? And some say, yeah, we heard that when we were in primary school. And so I'm like, okay, so who discovered the Americas? And the first, I mean, clearly, what, what's the, even for you all listening right now, What's the answer that automatically comes to mind? So even Columbus. after you're told there were nomads, there were indigenous persons who crossed the Bering Strait 10,000 BC, yeah. which would be 11,492 years before Columbus, Columbus. got lost. Yes. Yeah. But when you ask the when you're asked the question who discovered the Americas, you're thinking Christopher Columbus, even though he got lost in 1492 yes. and people crossed the Bering Strait from 10,000 BC. Yeah. So when you're talking about decolonization, you really have to question the things that we've been taught and have accepted to be true when they are lies. Because this is not the West Indies. India is still in the East. Yeah. India will never move from the East. <laughs> and yet they refer to us as West Indians and the indigenous people as Amerindians. They are not Amerindians. They are Tainos and Sibonis and Kalinagos and Mayas and yeah. Sioux and Cherokees and so on. So these are the things that I tell my students. Um, but it's not easy. And more teachers from the lower levels have to also be speaking of history in that way from that decolonized uh, perspective when they're teaching history. So let me, let me ask you this as a follow-up to what you're saying there, Ifashina. Mm -hmm. Perhaps then we need to look at revising the entire curriculum and the syllabus that pertains to history, in this case, Belizean history, because a lot of what we've been taught and you forgive me for using this description, it seems to have been formulaic. Yes. You go from standard one to standard two to standard three, et cetera, learning the same thing, but you aren't being taught to challenge at that young age some of what has been presented to us from a historical context. Mm -hmm. 
I agree with that. Definitely, there has to be a revision. I mean, one of the things, one of our big projects, our big dreams at the association is we want to write a comprehensive history of Belize that is by us, for us, by us, about us, not not from the colonizer's um, perspective. And it isn't that you then totally discount what happened with the colonizers. You have, it's, the, it's telling the whole story and getting it from the perspective of all the people who were here, including those who were here first, including the civilization that existed here Before. first. So one of the things that I always emphasize with my students as I'm teaching Belizean history is, for example, removing that word ruins when we're talking about oh, Maya temples. civilization. Because yeah, they did not destroy their cities. They made a very yeah. wise decision in a timely manner to preserve the environment which we now enjoy because it was unsustainable to be building cities at that time. And they did that long before Columbus got lost. So we can't be then referring to our national heritage as ruins. So that's something I, I keep <laughs> insisting every time, every semester that I teach Belizean history, I tell students, do not refer to Maya's or Maya sites, Maya ancient cities as ruins. That's one of the things, and it's hard people, it, people struggle with that, but that's one of the things we have to keep doing is changing the words we use. Language is one of the things that has been used against us as it relates to colonization. So we have to change the words that so we've learned that we keep using. In this case then, the politically correct term you would say would be an archeological site yes. as opposed to a ruin, correct? Yes. It's or archaeological site or ancient city. Mm -hmm. Call their names. It's Karakol, it's Lamana, it's Altunha. Yeah. Shunantunich. Call their names, Shunantunich. They we those are ancient cities. They were mm -hmm. cities, and that is the epitome of civilization, is the ability to build a city. And we have several in our country. When yeah. we talk about history in that way, it gives our students something to be proud of. So you cannot then be thinking that the people who got lost pirates, a bunch of buccaneers who are trying to undermine each other could come and civilize us. How could they come and civilize us when we already built cities, our civilization reached its height and started to change because we saw that there was a change that needed to happen. All of that happened before Columbus got lost, before we encountered the Spaniards and then the British and so forth. So if we see our history from the standpoint of our greatness, then we don't have to then be praising the colonizer. We start to praise our own selves and our own accomplishments. Some would argue that the colonizer brought uh, Christianity and religion to this part of Ooh, the world. No, you're going at home that... level, Isani. <laughs> no, but I, I, I'm only asking as, as mm -hmm. part of this entire conversation. It, it's, a, it's a robust topic, but where do you guys stand on that? Have you, have you um, contextualized that in, in terms of Belizean history? You know, it is part of the um, the historical domination of people mm -hmm. throughout history. That's what religion has been. So it, it is a piece of what you look at. It, you know that we know our history sufficiently to know that they killed the indigenous people who did not want to um, be Christianized. This, this was a part of control that uh, that we speak of. So it is one of the elements of what we have to look at. And that perhaps is one of the most difficult piece yes. for individuals to grapple with. Religion mm -hmm. is such a powerful tool of domination, it is. of colonization. Yeah. So in it response is. to your question, Isani, it is to say that, yes, this is one of the elements. We know we always hear don't have conversations about politics, religion. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose in in personal relationships, it's money. Yeah. Because those are the things that destroy relationships. And friendships. But it becomes an element of what we have to put on the table and dissect. We really have to answer the difficult questions. Well, apart from that, one of the issues that was of great concern to me earlier this year was how we view slavery. I remember at school we were told that slavery in Belize was not that bad. We were taught this at school. And we were taught that Creole did not have culture, but yet we were taught about the Mayan culture and the East Indian culture, etc. But I say all of that because this year, when the Black Lives Matter movement came about, I was surprised at the response of Belizeans. And it made me realize how much so indoctrinated they are 
are not aware as to what slavery really brought about. The comments I saw on Facebook by so-called enlightened, educated people in our society, I mean, I found myself in big fights with them on Facebook, telling them off, which is what was my reaction, because but it made me understand that people are yet to accept what slavery really was in this country and of course the rest of the Americas and that it is one of the vestiges of slavery that has kept us so mentally enslaved. When Belizeans can say mm -hmm. that we don't have that kind of racism, that blacks are just killing blacks and they do not understand the economic, intentional economic um, oppression of the slaves that leads us to where we are today, then I was aghast. And I, I just say that because what they don't realize is that when they said we were freed and mm -hmm. slavery was um, by law removed, none of the colonizers said, okay, for all the years that we exploited you, here is land and here is so much money so that you are on the same footing as those who were not enslaved. And the difference with the, the East Indian was that they were indentured laborers and they were made to feel better than the slaves and mm -hmm. they were being paid, even if it's a, a, a slave wages, they were being paid as opposed to the slaves. So I know that's a whole big topic, but it was the realization I had as to how far behind we are as a conscious people. And while in the rest of the Caribbean, it has been an easier um, um, discussion because they tend to be more dominantly black, mm -hmm. Belize being so um, 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 diverse, diverse yeah. and so much other cultures. I mean, I saw the claws of the different ethnic groups come out and attack. Mm -hmm. I know you can't go into the early discussion, but would you agree that the it whole issue of discussion of slavery in context of all the other ethnic groups is one it's of the most matter difficult. It's another topic, Audrey, of where, why, the, looking at our lecture this year, uh, we are, our panelists are taking just little snippets, but it is the, it's the theme and the topic that we can expand and explore uh, on decolonizing, decolonization in an independent Belize. What does it mean? What you describe is in fact the need for this conversation to go on, the need for research to be done, because what you speak to is what Delmar referred to as the mental component, mm -hmm. that colonization is such a stranglehold. We do not, we live it, we all live it. And part of what the Belize History Association is about is telling our Belizean story and telling our Belizean story, which is our history, means we have to grapple with some of the horrific things that we ourselves engage in. That is how we will get to a place where we can change the curriculum, the curricula that we have for school at different levels. It is how we will do what we need to do to make Belize move forward in the 21st century. I have a question for Delmar. Delmar being that you're in the classroom and I've seen you do other work with young people and the enthusiasm. While I see that we need to, to um, Belizeanize history and we're talking about colonization from the perspective of the, um, the British who came and colonized us, one of my concern is that while we are trying to shed off that level of colonization, would you agree with me that while we are dealing with that, there's a new form of colonization which um, access to the technology and media has brought, where I see now a lot of young people taking on a culture that is foreign to us, especially a US culture, the way they see themselves, the way young men and women expose themselves, which is not culturally the way we'd have done that. Don't you all see a challenge now that we're dealing with one form of colonization, and here comes this new one, and you as an educator in the classroom, how do you balance it now? Well, actually, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was just having a conversation about how do we decolonize the internet, for example. <laughs> exactly. um, precisely, precisely. <laughs> which is, um, I think, uh, as, as an educator, and, and uh, this is a perspective particularly from trying to get students to question particular concepts, it's, it, it is about a mind frame, and therefore I use what is on the internet. I, I think that the internet is, is such a, it's another world that provides a, a wide range of, of opportunities out there where you can sift through a lot of information and use that information to empower students. There are so many videos that can showcase 
not only the, the, the power of decolonizing, but also the realities of colonization. I mean, if you go to YouTube and you, and you look up for videos about Belize, you will notice that there, there are some videos of the 1980s, 1990s, and the language that they use to describe Belize, the, the, the footage that they show about Belize, um, the perspective that is used is all demeaning. Yeah. Yet, that was used to portray Belize and to, to in a way, uh, popularize Belize in the, other, um, in the other parts of the world. So that, to an extent, is a, 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 a component of colonialism. And we need to, or as a, as a teacher, I guide my students to look at that and say, what are these representations saying? We are battling with a culture, but I think that we will be lying to ourselves, or we would be lying to ourselves if we would be trying to remove our children from that. We need to get into a common ground because the reality is there is a future, and, and the future seems to be go heading that way day by day. So we need to find a common ground of how to use it to empower them and to have them change part of their culture as well. Well, I, as a parent of a preteen, I can tell you, and having raised two sons myself, that mm -hmm. a lot of, we expect a lot in the schools, but the first level of awareness is in the home. So you yeah. guys have a huge challenge ahead. Mm -hmm. I, because of my experience, I was able to decolonize myself, and I'm sure I still have vestiges of colonization. Mm -hmm. But having been able to do that and impart that to my children, one of the things I never forced on my children was religion, because I realized how much religion had affected me in my personal life, and not always positively. And so I had to decolonize myself and at the same token make sure that my children did not feel compelled, as many of us felt compelled in the home, to follow a doctrine. So much so that I have a daughter that she said, Mom, if I go by the Bible, then there was a lot of inbreeding. It says, because how could Adam and Eve be the parents of all of us? It says, then biologically, all of us should be having some defect. And when my 10-year-old told me that, I felt like I've done a good job. Now, yeah. that's at my level. I say that now to think that while you all, as educators, are changing things in the home, one of the biggest challenges I found is that the old heads just cannot see beyond that. It's either we have to give up that generation that we can't if, if have an impact on them and just accept that it's a new generation that we have to, to al allow them and teach them to think critically and question things and find, find themselves in a position where they're not enslaved by some of these theories that have enslaved us over the years. Well, I think the way to respond to, to elders and people who want to hold on to the old is, is simply making the point that, well, you have a cell phone now, mm -hmm. and back in the 70s, it didn't exist before. So culture is not something that stays static. It is dynamic. It is constantly changing. And so as things change, so, the, so, so should our thinking. The more we get information, the more uh, in touch with uh, a new perspective that we get, the, the better it is uh, for us to examine some of the things that we've held on to, that we've, we've been taught. So when it comes even back to the issue of the religion thing, I tell my students, I'm not telling you what to believe. I am just simply speaking to you about history. And I know for a fact that in 1618, the Spanish priests, they went into Maya communities and destroyed their religious yes. symbols and they destroyed their books and they flogged them and threatened to kill them if they did not subscribe to Christianity. That's a historical fact. Yes. That, is, that is not saying anything about you should believe or not believe in Christianity. It simply was done to our people in order for us to be Christians today. And that is something you should examine and think about because it's, it's historical fact. And I just stick to historical facts. So I think more and more of us need to truly just learn history, understand history, examine history, question history. And that right. historical fact leads into our constitution that says we are a church state democracy. And if you read our constitution, it was intended to continue that very same Christian indoctrination. So i leave it at that because it's a huge topic, but I'm really proud to see that you all are having that discussion. It will not change overnight. It's a discussion we need to have. I believe at the end of the day, it comes to us respecting other people's view, but making people have the information, letting them have knowledge, 
letting them decide that, look, there's not only one way, there's a lot of history that has been destroyed, okay. a lot of cultural good in many societies, like when you look at what the Africans did to survive, their medicinal practices, their spiritual practices, as the Mayans, even the, um, one of the oldest civilizations, the, the Indians or the East Indians as we call them, or the Hindus as we sometimes call them, but when we really learn history, mm -hmm. I'm amazed what all I learned about the practices of all these countries and, and people and where we are and how some of that came to Belize, how we destroyed some of that, and we think there's only one order, the white man's order, mm -hmm. the colonizer's order, you know? And so there's a lot of discussion. Let me, let me um, end the conversation by asking you guys uh, when and where, if any, will this presentation be made? I know it's part of the, the whole September celebration when do we expect this to be presented in a forum? September 16th? Yes, it's on Wednesday in two days. It's on Facebook live stream. Rene Villanueva is the moderator uh, for the panel presentation. It starts at 9.30. We invite and encourage everyone worldwide to tune in, get involved in the conversation as we rightly say, no matter um, how much time we allocate, we will not be able to uh, do the complete discourse. This is the beginning. Uh, so we invite people to get involved. Check us out. The Belize History Association includes the two of you co-hosts, mm -hmm. Audrey mm -hmm. and Isani, every Belizean, every friend of Belize, every resident of Belize, is a part of the History Association. We encourage people to become engaged members of the Belize History Association. Join us, sign up, so that you can get um, the emails of what is going on. We have a website. It's the Belize History Association.org. We have a Facebook page. Uh, we really encourage everybody to tune in. If you have a Facebook, it's live streaming. I'm learning some of these terms. And so I want to say, even as our elders are reaching that stage, uh, that is part of what um, Delmai says. It's a new era of colonization. But even as we have the imperial systems that colonized us, set up some structures that help to create, that are good. Everything is not bad. So we can yes. take advantage of what is of benefit. <clears throat> And that is part of what we're utilizing during this era of the pandemic. Perfect. Wednesday Thanks once again, guys. Facebook. Thank you. Perfect. Thank Thanks you. once again. And we now take this opportunity to go to a commercial break. When we return, it's for our final conversation, which is the introduction of a book titled A Rainbow in Her Eye. Stay tuned. This COVID update was brought to you by Foltex Systems. Your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service.